as we ended uh, the previous year. And, uh, today we have selected uh, to speak about pharmaceutical dose forms. Uh, the subject seems to be uh, a little bit um, abstract, but uh, in fact, um, we have noticed in the context of Unicom that uh, many questions are raised uh, around pharmaceutical dose forms. We have also noticed that the same in the uh, ISO TC215 working six uh, meetings. Uh, we already spoke a bit about that, and we have currently uh, a revision process for the standards and its um, implementation guide. So the ISO standard and the ISO technical specifications. So um, the discussion today also is going to feed uh, that uh, process. Uh, what are we going to speak about? So you see, uh, we speak here about the uh, 11239 uh, standard. Um, this is the, this um, standard, the, the expression of the dose form is very important, as many others, but this one is very important to generate uh, the pharmaceutical product identifier, especially the global uh, pharmaceutical product identifier. We have three speakers. Um, that will be in a sequence, uh, Ron uh, Fitzmartin uh, from the US FDA, and he will tell us um, uh, that the, uh, the FDA needs um, an expression of, of the pharmaceutical dose form less granular um, to, to fit uh, the PHP calculation. Um, then uh, Robert van der Stichele is going to give us the point of view from the clinical domain. And I hope uh, everybody knows that uh, uh, Unicom is looking at the full supply chain where we can and should use the IDMP. So that will be, I would say, on my right of the supply chain where the products are used. They have uh, also needs to express their PDF there. Chris Jarvis uh, is going to speak about uh, the revision process and what are the, the elements uh, which are taken, taken into account in that process. The <clears throat> speaker today, as I said, uh, uh, Ron Fitzmartin uh, will speak the first, comes uh, Robert van der Sichele, Chris Jarvis, you will see his face live um, on, the, on the screen after. And uh, we have panelists, Tony Morrison, who is with uh, SNOMED International, T.G. Uh, who is with the US FDA, Malin Fladvad, who is uh, with the WHO Content Center in, uh, in Uppsala. Uh, the speaker, speak, that's obvious. Uh, the panelists are here to enrich the discussion. That means that at uh, the end of the presentations, uh, the speaker will answer questions, of course, but uh, these questions came from the audience, can also come from the panelists, and uh, even from speaker to speaker or panelist to panelist, we can have exchanges when that enriches the conversation and our common knowledge. I hope uh, the rules are clear. And with this, I would like to give the floor to uh, Ron Fitzmartin. Uh, and uh, at that moment, all the others go on mute and uh, close their video. Ron, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you, Christian. Okay. Um, well, I hope everyone can hear me. I turned off all the mute buttons. Um, so uh, thank you for inviting us to uh, do this presentation. Really appreciate it. And um, looking forward to a, a, a good uh, dialogue conversation um, after uh, we all talk. So next slide, Christian, please. So I'm gonna talk um, three topics here. One on our concerns with the current ISO standard for dose form, specifically the technical specification 2440. Um, and then a, uh, a, a brief presentation on a uh, quick sum summary on the various meetings over the past couple of years that we've attended and 
um, and recently proposed um, possible solution to um, the concerns that um, we have raised. Um, and of course, uh, a, a use case for global PHPID kind of um, here's what it might look like um, when uh, if we uh, implement this uh, proposed solution and then a brief summary. Next slide, Chris. Thank you. So next slide. So the concerns. Um, I'm certainly not going to read these. I'm just going to uh, summarize these. Again, this is focused uh, principally on the technical spec of the 11.239 dose form uh, standard. Um, and in the uh, first section, there are some statements that are made um, about uh, harmonized controlled terminologies will be developed. Um, well, uh, you see in the sub bullet uh, bolded there that there hasn't been a uh, consensus on an international controlled terminology um, to date. Um, the next italicized uh, bullet there talks about provisions for mapping. Could you uh, just back up one slide? Provisions for mapping, um, uh, albeit uh, 2440 focuses a bit on mapping. It talks about mapping to a harmonized international controlled terminology, but that doesn't exist. Next slide, please. So, um, looking at section two, there is discussion about um, some required or mandatory um, uh, criteria that needs to be um, uh, available in uh, terminologies. And of course, um, we're saying here is that regional terminologies uh, shouldn't be required um, to conform uh, to the uh, these um, requirements in uh, 2440. Going to the next area there, um, the bottom line here for this um, uh, section one and then moving to section four is that we really, as a, a global community, and certainly within ISO, um, have not identified and come to a consensus on a final international controlled terminology. And so that's really the driving force here. Um, and it is clearly um, outlined in 2440 that there would likely be one, but we know this document has been around quite a while and we haven't as a community uh, worked on that um, consensus terminology. Next slide. So, we, uh, uh, FDA, working with our, our colleagues at NCIEVS, um, we developed, uh, we, we uh, did this mapping of these terminologies that you see here, um, our US FDA terminology, SNOMED, um, a Health Canada terminology that we pulled off of the uh, Health Canada website, um, the CDIS terminology, and of course, it's important to say that, um, and this is also um, uh, the truth and also probably part of the problem, um, mapping um, is difficult. And mapping criteria um, from one region to another region uh, likely would be different or could be different. So uh, what you see here of these mapping percentages of one-to-one of various terminologies to an EDQM terminology could be different if you did it yourself. Um, but the, the goal of this slide is to show that region to region terminology mapping um, from our perspective of having been uh, trying to do this for several years now um, is not a viable solution. So we turn to um, finding uh, something that is workable, not only uh, within one region, but for all regions for global uh, IDMP. Next slide, please. So um, everyone who's familiar with the uh, the ISO standards for IDMP certainly know this particular slide. Um, it's taken from, as you can see there, uh, from the 2451 on um, uh, 
PHP ID, the technical spec, and it shows um, the three inputs into PHP ID. And when we started to look at this, it was for the one use case that was certainly very important for global IDMP, and that's um, a global PHP ID. So those three inputs are dose form, substance ID, and strength, and you see that they call for a central code. Um, spe specifically, the dose form calls for a central code. So as I said before, we haven't harmonized on any central terminology or central code. So obviously that cannot be done uh, today. Next slide, please. So um, we need to determine what that code might be. Next slide, please. And so what, 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 what is PHP ID? What is the goal for PHP ID? Well, it's really um, the guts, if you will, of, or the end game of um, IDMP is finding that, um, generating that PHP ID, which then is the mechanism to associate like medicinal products um, around the, uh, the world. That is it in a nutshell. Um, uh, and if we uh, um, have a global consensus on what uh, dose form representations are, not only for dose form, but we also have to do this for substance, but that's for another day, um, we can then share the same PHP ID at each respective PHP ID level. Without the global consensus on the IDs, we cannot do that. So what's the downside? Next slide. So for, for us as FDA, um, uh, what really uh, has driven us over the past more than now going on three years is that um, we looked at the um, the first four levels of PHP ID at the substance uh, uh, level one, uh, two, three, and four, and we see that um, we would not be able to uh, participate if, in fact, we don't harmonize on dose form. And if there isn't a harmonization on dose form code, um, then there needs to be another solution, and that's where we started to say that mapping is not the way. Perhaps we need to focus more on the characteristics of the dose form rather than the dose form uh, itself. Next slide, please. And so um, we embarked, uh, my colleague TJ Chen and I, next slide, please, um, not only internal to FDA, um, presenting this and working with our, um, our, our colleagues at uh, NCI, Enterprise Vocabulary Service, um, but also started to discuss this within the ISO community. And you see there that we, we presented um, the concerns and then eventually our proposed solution at various meetings um, now go, almost going on uh, uh, two years. Um, and it was at the October meeting from last year um, that we made um, a uh, proposal um, that centrally maintain a set of dose form characteristics to describe dose form term and code could possibly you be used uh, in global IDMP and for the specific use case of generation of uh, PHP ID. So, um, there was a general agreement within work group six at the international level that we should pursue this um, and see uh, uh, where this would take us uh, with respect to finding a solution. Um, so um, a request was made by work group six, six uh, to initiate uh, revisions to 2440 and to 11239 as necessary. And um, most of you know that uh, Chris Jarvis from EDQM, um, it chairs that uh, uh, subgroup of work group six. Next slide, please. So um, 
we um, early on we certainly started to show the concerns about um, the current standard and the and the character and the um, uh, 2440 tech spec. But then we rapidly said, okay, um, we need to find um, a solution. Uh, we need to uh, propose something that we can use that regional terminologies um, can use, and then we that'll help us get to that global PHP ID. So um, we started to look at actual uh, cases, and we uh, worked with our terminology, um, looked at uh, marketed products that we have, um, and trying to see whether this could work. So um, the next few slides just take three products and uh, takes a look at how this might might work. So what we did was we said, okay, um, we there's no central terms. The terminology um, from one region to another uh, is very granular. Um, mapping, as we we uh, demonstrated. Um, uh, is a chore. Some people say it can be done, but um, we spent too much time <laughs> looking at it and seeing that it's just not a solution going forward. Um, and term definitions are also an uh, issue as well. So when you eliminate that um, and you focus on centrally maintained dose form characteristics, um, a lot of the issues melt away. And so we said, you know what? The EDQM6 characteristics are right there in our face. Um, they um, can uh, possibly be leveraged um, to, uh, uh, for global IDMP. And you see those uh, six characteristics um, there. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna go through um, three examples if uh, time permits. Here's the first slide of uh, example A. Um, this is probably familiar to you. This is the hierarchy um, from uh, EDQM. It's the hierarchy proposed in the um, uh, 2440. And you see the characteristics there uh, with their respective code for adaptoline benzoyl peroxide gel. Next slide. So when you take the two regional terminologies, the FDA terminology, EDQM, you see gel for EDQM, you see the C code gel for FDA for these two products. Next slide, please. Now, when you look at it from characteristics, so forget about uh, um, uh, any uh, actual uh, term code, term definition, you just look at it from a characteristic perspective. Of course, those characteristics do have definitions as well. Uh, that's uh, certainly clear. But when you look at it from EDQM gel, and then you create a concatenated code from those characteristic codes, and you apply them to the FDA terminology, those codes match uh, perfectly. Next slide. So it would be that concatenated code, which now provides some rich, um, I might add, rich information on the dose form itself. That would be the input into um, the PHP ID, uh, which gives us um, the opportunity then to eventually group like medicinal products. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to skip this one uh, in, in the spirit of time and go to the a little more complex. Can we fire through this and go to example C, Chris? Right. Oh, back up one. Uh, go forward. Right there. Uh, oh no. Yeah. 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 Good. Thank you. Um, so here's a tri triaxon sodium, um, two grams powder for solution for injection. So here's the hierarchy, very familiar. Um, uh, something that many of us are now accustomed to seeing this. Um, what we're not accustomed to seeing 
is the basic administral dose form, um, which is discussed in 2440, um, which is important for these types of dose forms that have a transformation. So we've added that yellow box. Next slide. So here we go. Um, on the left, we have EDQM, powder for solution for injection. Um, it is very granular. Um, it also has a solution for injection. We have a solution at FDA for injection. Um, so very similar here. Now, next slide. But here's where we have a transform, right? Um, and um, well, I guess we missed one. I don't know where we missed that i wanted to show that slide but uh, anyway we see the um the edqm uh characteristics here we only show four characteristics because we we believe with the addition of a um a minister dose form uh characteristic um there we can um fully characterize the transformed dosage form with those four characteristics for Ceph trioxide. And there you go. Um, you see that um, those characteristics are the same for FDA versus EDQM. And when you go to the last slide, it then again becomes the input into the, um, the PHP ID. So the last couple of slides, I believe, are just a couple of summary slides. Next slide, please. So we feel that a centrally maintained uh, coded dose form characteristic can in fact be a, a solution for global IDMP and specifically PHPID. Um, we believe that these centrally maintained, very important, dose form characteristics provide a consensus-based solution for global IDMP and it allows for regional regulatory differences that we feel is very important. And I believe um, the, um, uh, the documents, IDMP documents, um, also um, focus on regional differences and go that way as well. It's clear that um, we have uh, the EDQM dose form characteristics. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. They should be leveraged to determine the optimal number of dose form characteristics for global IDMP. I think um, we feel that that is certainly the way to go. Next slide. It might be. Um, the, depending upon the way the work group uh, discusses this in, in the coming weeks and months, um, as you can see, maybe there will be uh, a need for another characteristic um, uh, to fully characterize administrable dose uh, forms. Um, but that's for discussion. Um, the use of codes to convey the meaning of dose forms allows regions to develop and use and maintain their own terminologies. So we believe the characteristics allow um, both worlds to uh, coexist, regional terminologies and a centrally maintained set of dose form characteristics. Of course, there would need to be some principles, some guidance around dose form characteristics. We believe that uh, um, that should be codified in the ISO, in an ISO document, but, I, but we believe that um, this can be done um, uh, without uh, a tremendous amount of time uh, and, and effort. Um, I think that's probably it. Thank you very much. That's it, uh, Ron. Thank you very much. Um, I see we have one question here, and I suppose it is very much linked to uh, what you have said. Um, I will read that, and maybe uh, you or another panelist can uh, respond to that. What will be the link between regional dose forms and the proposed centrally maintained dose form terms and ID? Will the central global dose form and PHP ID concept coexist with already available regional terminology? Ron? 
Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's a, I think it's a multifaceted uh, question, um, which is good. Um, so we feel that um, uh, once the, uh, if the dose form characteristics is the solution and we codify that in uh, the document uh, 2440 and maybe some other um, of the standards need to be tweaked to make sure that they're, um, uh, they're aligned. Um, we feel that um, the, there needs to be an organization. Uh, maybe it's, uh, it is, in fact, EDQM, and Chris Jarvis uh, certainly can address this since they certainly uh, cur they currently curate those characteristics. Um, it might be um, the place for those character characteristics to be curated. Um, as far as um, then going a step further to the next dimension of the uh, dose form characteristic codes themselves, um, uh, perhaps a global organization such as um, uh, WHO UMC um, could be the, the organization that maintains those dose form characteristics. Um, there's been a lot of discussion in the various communities that, of um, what organization could in fact um, maintain uh, those characteristics and also um, PHP IDs themselves. Um, so regions might be able to develop them, but then there certainly uh, may need to be a, um, an international body that maintains them, that uh, um, assesses uh, validation criteria, et cetera. I hope that answers your question. Please, uh, uh, any of my colleagues, um, please chime in. Yeah, maybe I, I can Marie. comment here, Christian. Yes. 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 So also uh, uh, for um, uh, maintaining a global PHP ID, uh, which we are currently uh, working on in the Unicorn project to see how it would work. I think this is a very good opportunity. I mean, the scenario could be that you use these characteristics to map into the world the regional terminologies to create the PHP ID. Uh, and uh, then there are, as Ron said, things that need to be um, validated. And that's what we are actually now planning to do to look into uh, using the characteristics for the PHP ID and see what would that mean? Would the four characteristics give enough specificity to create unique PHP IDs? And since we already have a good set of uh, uh, data uh, that are in the pilot for the Unicorn project, we have a very good opportunity here to also compare with the EDQM current standard that has been used in Unicom. Uh, so I think it's this is a very good opportunity and we should um, just, as Ron said, uh, look into it and actually test it on real live data. Thank you, Marin. Um, there is another question, but I would like to uh, postpone the answer to that uh, second question, because I think uh, uh, it will come also to uh, what Chris Jarvis is going to tell us uh, later. So if um, the, the colleague uh, having raised, raised the question is uh, uh, fine with it, we will wait uh, that. Uh, and then um, I want to give the floor to uh, Robert van der Sichele, uh, who is our next chair. And uh, as you understood from my few words uh, as introduction, uh, we started to speak uh, on the regulatory side, so uh, on the left side of the supply chain. And now uh, Robert is uh, bringing us uh, to the right side, the use of the, the information. Robert, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Um, so this speech will be on the clinical need for the pharmaceutical dose forms in all its forms, the manufactured dose form and the administrable dose form. And we also discussed some aggregation 
functionalities. Uh, next slide. The main focus of this talk will be on the European Directory of Quality in Medicines, the EDQM. And you know, it contains the standard terms for those forms, but it's a, a more general system to standardize all the terms for many concepts of the medicinal product identification, including the pharmaceutical dose form. I think it's a European achievement that is globally recognized. Next slide. We will talk in, in this talk on, on, we can first give a short description of EDQM, then look at the tools that we use to analyze um, the dose forms in EDQM, look at the problems that resulted from that analysis, and that could also be issues for the revision of, um, um, of the ISO term, and that should be the technical specification 2240. Then solutions, that we propose. And then finally, we end with a proposal for an ontology driven high level of aggregation of those forms. Next slide. Next slide. European pharmacopoeias, big, big books on pharmacy matters originated from a long standing tradition of pharmacopoeia. On the right, you see the uh, Pharmacopoeia Royale Galenique et Chimique the Paris, uh, edited in 1676, still under the privilege of Louis XIV. Um, these are works about lists and drugs and collections of recipes, formulas and prescriptions for compounding of medical preparations. So it's a, it's a long history. Next slide. Even further in the medieval times, this is what is called a vade mecum, to go with me. It's a folio of letter folios uh, hanging on the belt of surgeons where they could scribble all kinds of uh, things that they want to remind. And it's the uh, medieval forerunner of the modern physician desk reference. Next slide. That has evolved over the ages in a number of pharmacopoeias, the famous British pharmacopoeia, the, the smaller um, example of Belgium, the USP drug information for the healthcare professional, and then finally the European pharmacopoeia, edited by the Directory of Quality of Medicines and which also with also the ICT counterpart of um, the IDQM standard terms. Next slide. IDM IDQM is very important for IDMP. It has 494 different standard dose forms, um, each with six non-definitional but highly standardized characteristics, each with a comprehensive lexical definition each with a multilingual translation in a controlled terminology. It's publicly available, it's for free. Uh, this is the website and it is the basis of the European SPOR register that is being built right now um, for, um, for the EMA regulation. And it's also governed, as we said, by an ISO standard. Next, the six characteristics, which I've already uh, seen that before, the basic dose form 51, uh, different terms, state of matter five, transformation six, release characteristics four different terms, intended size 23, and administration method 19. Next. Next slide. Yeah. Here we have made the index of these six characteristics, so the value sets of each of these, um, the, the 51 are too small to read, but this is a reduction from five or nearly 500 dose forms to 50 those basic dose forms, so that's a reduction from 10 to 1. Uh, and then the rest, you see that the, the, the value set is not so big. Next. We, what were the tools we used for analyzing this resource? Next. We did analysis in Excel of these unique combinations of six characteristics, and then also an ontological analysis of the structure of EDQM with, prote with Protégé. That is a software package, a free open source ontology editor and frameworks that has been used for visualizing and building ontologies. It has been used for the transition of ICD-10 ICD to ICD-11. Next. And from that analysis, we saw that these 494 granular ADQM dose forms are reduced to 372 occurrences of unique combinations of the six characteristics. 
And that splits again in 290 occurrences of unique combinations that are linked to one single PD uh, pharmaceutical dose form and 82 occurrences of unique combinations that are linked to more than one uh, pharmaceutical dose form, grouping for 204 pharmaceutical dose forms uh, ranging from two to six per line and with an average of three. Next. What were the problems that we en encountered and that could possibly be an issue for the revision? Next, yeah. The injections versus infusion versus injection and infusion uh, is um, often very well explicited in the description of the dose form, but it's not transposed to the intended site value set. In the value set of intended site, cutaneous and transdermal are put together, while it are clearly two different things. Sometimes there is a problem with combination of attributes, drops that are for the eye or for the ear or for both. And that's not always clear either. Some of these um, those forms are for solvents and non-medical ingredients of mixtures or for medical devices or for veterinary products. And then we have also listed some minor issues on the Excel analysis. Next. This is an example of ambiguity, which we discovered with regard to systemic or local effect. Let's take the example of the chewable tablet, soft. It's a solid single preparation containing an contained in a soft shell. It's intended to be chewed to release the content in the mouth. It is same, the content is semi-solid or liquid. Uh, intended for or for local action or for systemic delivery after absorption through the oral mucosa or to be swallowed into the gastrointestinal uh, tract. And that's either a local effect or a mouth mucosal absorption without li first liver pass effect or a gastrointestinal absorption with liver first pass exit. So that's really a difference and it's not reflected uh, in, the, in the naming, the definition and the characteristics. Next. And then we have the problem of the, the, the way the pharmaceutical dose form is either a manufactured dose form or an administrable dose form. On the left, we see the manufactured dose form, the powder in a bottle, that through a process of transformation, in this case, solution or dissolution, will lead to a syrup that is then the administrable dose form. Yes, next one. We have listed some of the precise definitions. I'm not gonna read it. I just um, put it here for, um, for your convenience. The pharmaceutical dose form is the physical manifestation of a product that contains active ingredients or inactive ingredients. It can either be the administrable dose form or the manufacturer. Next. The manufactured dose form is the pharmaceutical dose form of a manufactured item as manufactured and when applicable before transmission, transformation into the pharmaceutical product. Next. Next. The administrable dose form is the pharmaceutical dose form as administered to the patient after any necessary transformation of the package manufacturer pharmaceutical form has been carried out. And then the next is not to be the yeah, next, not to be mistaken for the manufactured item, which, yeah, which is a qualitative and quantitative composition of a product contained in the packaging of the medicinal product. So that's a concept far deep down in the IDMP logical description model of national products. Yes, the next. Next. So the problem is that the administrable dose form is not made explicit in ADQM. From the 220 unique combinations with a single pharmaceutical dose form, 187 are labeled with a tag, no transformation, meaning that the manufactured dose form is equal to the administrable dose form. 103 are labeled as to be transformed in an administrable dose form. For the 82 unique combinations with multiple pharmaceutical dose forms, 26 are labeled as to be transformed into an administrable dose form. And the problem is that this administrable dose form is not made explicit, not really made explicit within EDQM. It's indicated that the manufactured dose form is to be transformed, but it's not always explicitly named into which pharmaceutical dose form it is transformed. And that's 
important because, as you see, as you know, for the pharmaceutical product that's central by voter concept in IDMP, it is defined by the administrable dose form. Next. Here we have listed from these 82 lines with multiple PDFs uh, what the administrable dose form could be, but with uh, some questions left or right because it's not really explicit. Next. So, in conclusion of this aspect, the pharmaceutical dose form is a container term for the manufactured dose form and for the administrable dose form. The manufactured dose form is the pharmaceutical dose form of the manufactured item. The administrable dose form is the pharmaceutical dose form of the pharmaceutical product. So, and in this slide from uh, the ISO standard, this is repeated again and illustrated with an example. Power for solution for injection to be transformed by dissolution to solution for injection. Okay, next. We will illustrate that with an example and with a recent example, the Pfizer BioNTech coded 19 vaccine. It's presented in pizza boxes, uh, 195 vials in one box. One multi-dose vial contains 0 0.5 milliliter concentrate for solution for injection that has to be diluted with 1.8 saline to 2.5 milliliter in a concentration of 100 microgram per milliliter RNA. One dose is 0 0.3 milliliter and officially there are six doses. The manufactured dose form is concentrate for solution for injection and the administrable dose form is solution for injection. 2.5 milliliter after dilution. So the data need for the PHPID is the substance name. There is now an INN name Tosinamiran. Scientifically, there are other names that are very difficult to pronounce. I will not even try to do that. Um, there is a number in the European Substance Register, and there's a number already in the FD, in the American code system. The administrable dose form is solution for injection, and the strength is 100. The strength unit is UG per milliliter. It's not a uh, typo. It's, it should be microgram, but um, UCUM works with the ASCII code and transformed the micro in an U. So the pharmaceutical dose form is dosimazenagram, solution for injection, 100 microgram per milliliter. And from that, the PHPID could be calculated using the hash function. Next. There is here a note to be presented on the inconsistency between jurisdictions. UK was first to recognize it, then the US and then the EU. In the UK, the pharmaceutical dose form is the manufactured dose form, concentrate for solution for injection, and the brand name is COVID-19 MRA vaccine, BNT 16-2B2. In the EU, the administrable dose form is called dispersion for injection, which is not, by the way, not an ADQM term, and the brand name is Comirnaty. And in the US, the administrable dose form is not named, but supposed to be solution for injection, as the process of transformation is dilution. And that is the brand name. So if you don't believe me about these astounding differences, that's, these are the three references to the uh, public uh, information uh, of the marketing authorizations of the three jurisdictions. And it, next. Next. I think this example learns us that there is probably a need for a centralized procedure for the production for PHPID with the correct subscription of the pharmaceutical product with regard to substance, administrable dose form and strength. And it may be good, we have already discussed it, that this under the supervision of the World Health Organization um, and maybe the Center for Pharmacovigilance is the best candidate. And uh, it's also an incentive to cooperate with other well-structured terminologies such as SNOMED CT. And I have brought, next slide, next slide. Here we have the, uh, placed next to each other two models for drug prescriptions. One of SNOMED in the right and the left is the IMP skeleton. This was presented by Tony Morrison at the 2020 SNOMED Expo. Uh, it shows the two, the two models and then the links between the two models. We are not going to, into the detail, but I, you can see that these are two different forms of spaghetti. 
but that there are uh, clear links between the two systems. And we could take advantage of that, especially with regard to the terminology for um, the dose form, which is a very important issue in this. Next. So the solutions proposed, next slide. I think it's really good to revise some of the lexical definitions we are, which are a little bit ambiguous. Maybe we can revise the domain values of some of the characteristics. For instance, in injection, infusion, injection, infusion. If that's in the dose name, it should also be in the characteristics value set. Cutaneous transdermal is maybe a value set that should be split. Lingo and Euromacazal the same. If possible, the characteristics should become definitional, and then they should be governed by a semantically formalized definition. We could adapt for clinical use cases these characteristics to achieve and achieve this by studying the definitions and the ontology of the characteristics. And maybe, and that is a matter for discussion, add the dimension of the systemic impact on the body. By also, that can be done by adding a seventh characteristic or by revising the value set of intended sites. Next. So this is, in fact, it is a plea for sticking to the outspoken granularity uh, of ADQM in the description of dose forms. So we remain around 500 different uh, dose forms. Next, and the rationale for that is, I think, well illustrated in an article of 2001 in Methods of Information in Medicine by a German group from, um, from Heidelberg, Eiffeli, who has created this ontology of drug application, um, where you see that the pharmaceutical form is quite important um, and, and detailed. And this is a wonderful article that also illustrates with many examples uh, from the clinical, from, from decision support systems, uh, that the pharmaceutical details on the pharmaceutical form are really important to guide uh, clinical decision support. Next one, so that's where we, we so that's for um, rebuilding ADQM and, and making small changes internally. Okay. Um, building we, we have also a proposal to go a little bit beyond ADQM and to build a simple ontology for a higher level of aggregation of those forms. Next slide. And this could be governed by six characteristics and maybe one. This is a snapshot of, web protege, of ADQM in Web Protégé, where, um, for instance, the pharmaceutical dose form here capsule heart has been selected and where you see the definition appear, the different translations and beneath are the characteristics. So that's what we use to, to analyze this and, and to maybe to help us to build this higher aggregation. Next. Next slide. The advantage of working with an ontological tool is that you can discover some missing elements, for instance, the explicit mystical dose form uh, the absence of the systemic dimension, uh, that we can analyze the consistency of the definition and the six characteristics, and that we can do this in a collaborative way for reorganizing the value sets and the domain values of the six characteristics. It can also help us to build the higher levels of aggregation of those forms suitable for more clinical use case. Next. This is the article on which we built, based the groundwork for this, um, for this work. And it was a, a work done for the Belgium uh, e-health system where we operationalized the rules for implementation of prescribing by international non proprietary name. And uh, it also be, became an, an official recommendation of the Belgium agency. And you see the website for that. Next. And the idea is that uh, you start from the, from, that you build higher aggregations from the dose form built on an ontology, which is firmly rooted in ADQM. For instance, 
uh, you start from IDMP pharmaceutical product, who has, as we know, three characteristics, the granular substance, the granular EDQM dose form and the strength. And this can then be aggregated to what we can call a virtual medicinal product group, red, uh, containing all, all the pharmaceutical products that can be generated by one INN prescription um, with a substance, not the granular one, but the INN one, and aggregated dose form, and uh, again, the strength. And next, next. So that should be governed, that aggregation to a higher level should be governed. Next, the dose form by an ontology dose form and the substance next by a substance ontology. And next slide. This is an overview of 23 domain values that we could use for this higher level of, um, uh, of abstraction. It's taken from that article from the Belgian project. 23 domain values uh, in three languages. We are in Belgium. Uh, and 23 domain values or their combinations. So uh, just to, to illustrate that uh, work in this direction has already been done. Next slide. Use cases for the higher level of aggregation could be fair substitution, correct prescribing by international non proprietary name, INN, correct implementation of a definition of polypharmacy being more correct, chronic use of five or more systemic medication at the same time, the same patients, for rationalizing the linking of medicinal product to international classifications, and to simplify uh, the international application of decision support rules with regard to national medicinal products. Next. This is our final slide before conclusions. On the right, you see a number of databases in different countries, a database from the agency, the medicinal product dictionary, the e-health database, the database from the vendors of the uh, e-prescription systems, uh, all data, different databases within the same country and replicated in other countries uh, an, an equal number of databases. These could all be linked by the pharmaceutical product, which is the most granular abstract representation, representation of a national medicinal product characterized by these three granular um, characteristics, the substance and the dose, IGDQM, and then through the process of an aggregation governed by an ontology, um, aggregated to, sm to a smaller number of VMP groups, which is the medicinal products, which could then be the basis to get the correct link to the ATC, to SNOMED, to Eric's norm, and to other forms of drug ontology. That's a, big, that's a little bit the ID, and I will end with my conclusion slide next. ADQM, the pharmaco European Pharmacopé, is a grand old lady, not to be thinking with lightly. I think it is a very good candidate for to be the central terminology, either through the characteristics or in itself. Some strategic revisions might increase its value even more, but these should be based on a thorough analysis of the definitions and the list of domain values of some characteristics could be slightly altered. We could enter a systemic dimension and the administrable dose form must be made explicit. In my opinion, high granularity must be maintained for correct identification of medicinal product. The characteristics could become definitional if they are governed by a semantically formalized definition and adaptation for clinical use case could be achieved by studying the definitions and the ontology of the characteristics. So that's it. And I thank you for your attention and we're awaiting the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Robert. Well, uh, we are now starting to run uh, out of time. Um, I propose that uh, if you have questions uh, for Robert, you use the Q&A facility and I will ask Robert to have an eye on the Q&A facility to see if he can uh, respond directly by 
uh, typing the response. Um, so uh, we can continue our journey with uh, um, the next presentation, which will be, I think, a little bit shorter, but uh, certainly not less interesting, uh, by Chris Jarvis from the EDQM. Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christian, and uh, thanks, of course, to Ron and uh, Robert for those presentations. Uh, this is a, a good demonstration of the complications that we have with pharmaceutical dose forms, depending on really what their purpose is and how they're used in different, um, different regions. Uh, this presentation is really going to be looking more at the, uh, what this means for the revision that we have coming up for, for these two documents, as uh, Christian said. Uh, so if we have a look at the next uh, slide, this is just um, a reminder of um, just an overview of the timelines. Uh, these, the two documents, 112 through 9, the standard, and the um, implementation guide, the TS20440, uh, were approved for um, the systemic, uh, systematic revision in May 2020. And this will be the first time that they've been revised. So the 11239 was the first, I think, of the IDMP standards to be published, or one of the first two. And that's going back to November 2012. And then the technical specification uh, was published in uh, June 2016. Uh, the aim is to provide drafts to uh, ISO TC215 Working Group 6 in May. And this is really based on the, uh, the 24 month limit which is put in place for the standard, so the 11239. Um, that would allow us to provide the disk ballot in time and then hopefully have the, the revised version two years after the initial agreement to publish to revise it. Well, the, well, the DTS ballot, so the, the technical specification, I don't believe is a strictly guide, uh, strictly sort of, um, um, it doesn't have to necessarily be within 24 months, but these two really just need to go together. So it's made sense to, to really go along the same timeline. Uh, having said that, as, as has been mentioned by Ron in particular, the, the main work really does, it's probably going to be needed to be done in 20440, but there might be some changes needed in the standard itself. Uh, so moving on now to some other things to bear in mind. Uh, I, I've labelled this restraints because we really can't just do whatever we want with the standards. Uh, it was agreed by Working Group 6, uh, by the TC215, that the scope of the documents shouldn't change. Um, we always have to bear in mind that backwards compatibility is necessary. You can't put a standard out there and then completely change it um, because it has been there for, a, for, a, uh, for many years now. So there are no radical for cha uh, changes foreseen. Um, but you know, of course, there can be uh, adjustments made as have been uh, proposed. And also need to bear in mind that they, these are really interlinked standards and any impact that this standard change might have on others really does need to be carefully considered. And obviously the whole working group six will need to be involved in, um, in assessing that. So I guess the, the purpose of the, the systematic revision um, the main driver was uh, the, um, the concern about the lack of a global PHPID and the lack of agreement on terms to be used. When, when the standard was originally created, when the whole IDMP uh, suite of standards were, were being developed, it really was done with the view that um, a single set of control vocabularies would be agreed on by the, uh, by the regulators to, to use to communicate with each other. And as has been mentioned, this hasn't happened. So in particular, this is a problem for pharmaceutical dose forms. And as we've seen, there's such different um, uses of these terms and in the different regions that it's understandable that that's the most complicated part of it. So um, the alternative that is being proposed is to allow the use of these uh, central lists of pharmaceutical dose form characteristics. And although, although it was really the global PHPID that was the driver for this, it is also an opportunity to, to consider how those characteristics can be used, um, where, for example, the full pharmaceutical dose form isn't appropriate, whether it's because um, in a region they simply don't have the same granularity, or whether there is a lack of information, or as uh, Robert's um, 
uh, presentation, whether they can be used really to, to help to aggregate dose forms and look at them in a different way. So it's uh, more to do with pushing the use of the, the individual characteristics. Um, so on the next slide, just as, as the, the global PHPID is um, really the, was the driver behind it, I just, um, if you can move to the next one, Christine, please. There we go. <clears throat> um, we do need to bear in mind, as I said, that this will have an impact on particularly the 11616 documents, the, the documents related to PHPID and the, the technical specification that um, goes alongside it. Uh, as Malin has already uh, taken the, I was pleased to, to hear Malin previously step in and mention about this. There is a discussion of the pilots to look at the impact of using this, um, the following this proposal uh, on the generation of PHPID and the fact that it's, it can be compared with what was already done in Unicom, I think will be extremely useful. So that's gonna be a very important part of us, uh, of us going forward here to really work out if this works and what the what the constraints will be um, and as has been mentioned by by uh, both the speakers it is important to remember that the administrable dose form is needed and not the manufactured dose form and I, I, on the next slide it just this is repetition a bit but I think it's a point that which is often overlooked um, so I've just just to compare the manufactured and administrable dose forms again if we imagine that you have this medicinal product it's um, the manufactured item, so what, what is sent by the manufacturer, what you have in the pharmacy, for example, that has the pharmaceutical dose form powder for oral solution. But when it's given to the patient, it has to be transformed. And then that pharmaceutical product, as it's then referred to, that also has the pharmaceutical dose form uh, characteristics, uh, pharmaceutical dose form uh, oral solution. Uh, if we have a look at a second medicinal product, you might find the same, the same preparation, which is actually uh, sent to the pharmacy, manufactured as the solution as it is. So that doesn't need to be transformed. It carries from the very start, the manufactured item is described with the pharmaceutical dose form oral solution, as is the pharmaceutical product. So when it's considered to, even though no changes has happened, when it's given to the patient, it still has the same pharmaceutical dose form oral solution. So if you look at these two here, um, both of them need to carry a ministerial dose form oral solution. That's in the, the MPID standard. So uh, the medicinal product itself, if it follows the, the IDMP requirements, it will have a manufactured item. It'll have a dose form describing that. It'll have pharmaceutical product. It'll have the dose form describing that. And if everything else is the same, if the substance is the same and the strength in the final uh, oral solution that's provided is the same, then these products will have the same PHPID. So even though one is provided as a powder from the manufacturer, the other is provided straight as the solution, they will both be considered for PHPID purposes as having the same, the same properties. So it's just a little demonstration to show that the PHPID really does um, it's linking together similar products, not absolutely identical um, products. <clears throat> okay, so just going back onto, onto the next slide then, um, uh, moving back just more generally, uh, what does this revision proposal mean for the documents? So as I mentioned, the main idea is to allow the use of the individual characteristics for the dose forms directly. Uh, in the standards as they are currently written, they're intended only really to help organize and identify pharmaceutical dose forms, not be used directly in the generation of other codes in IDMP. <clears throat> um, we acknowledge that as it stands, some granularity is gonna be lost if you just use the characteristics instead of a full pharmaceutical dose form with the definition. Um, it's because the characteristics are not definitional, they are meant for uh, organizing the, the terms. Um, however, that's not necessarily a bad thing, uh, depending on how the global PHP idea is used, for example, 
uh, for pharmacovigilance, it might be considered to be an advantage. This is really what needs to be looked into um, in, the, in the pilots that uh, Malin and um, Ron have mentioned. Um, there are other use cases where really focusing on the certain characteristics might also be useful. Um, prescribing systems, for example, it might be helpful to be able to, to group them together. Uh, it's similar to, as uh, Robert was saying, but aggregating the, uh, uh, the relevant pharmaceutical dose forms. So when you're building the system, maybe really looking at the characteristics themselves. If you, don't, you just want an oral preparation uh, or maybe an oral solid one, you can do that. And then that will show you what the pharmaceutical dose forms are available that hold those characteristics. But in other cases, the full pharmaceutical dose form is going to be essential. Um, and it's not the intention to remove it from the standard. That would be, um, I think that would be a mistake and it would really interfere with the backwards compatibility. But it doesn't mean that they can't live side by side, but it all does depend on how they're going to be used in IDMP and elsewhere. Um, and of course, we can't really cover all of the possible uses of these control vocabularies. <clears throat> um, a lot of them might be covered by uh, PHPID and MPID, but there could be other, uh, as we're seeing this already expanding from just the regulatory use of IDMP into uh, more clinical use, we'll find more uses for these, uh, for these concepts. But the, the standards themselves really are designed on to tell you how to build the controlled vocabularies themselves, not necessarily every single way that they, they need to be used. Um, so on the next slide, please. Uh, another reminder is, of course, this is really focused on pharmaceutical dose forms, but these standards do cover other vocabularies. And we need to bear in mind that they, they cover the routes of administration, units of presentation and packaging as well. And they will have a similar sort of core, uh, the way that the, the, um, the way that the, the elements are built up is similar, it's uh, similar for all of them. And we need to bear that in mind if we're gonna propose any changes, not to chuck everything out and forget about everything else because they also do have uh, important roles in IDMP. So what I think the revision proposal should really do is just push forward also the individual dose form characteristics to this list of uh, existing terms and control vocabularies that can be used in IDMP. <clears throat> so uh, next slide, please. Um, I think what we will need to do uh, is to provide some examples of how those might be used. Really just examples, we can't be complete, of course. And there is going to be a lot of effect, I think, particularly for 11616 documents. So that must be borne in mind. Um, there are certain things which we can't cover, which shouldn't, which don't belong in these standards, which do belong in, in maybe um, the 11616, the PHPID documents. And as I said, of course, the verification of these proposals is going to be, it's going to be very important uh, to work out not just whether it's feasible, but also how it will be implemented and to make everyone aware of what the difference would be if we go down this route compared to that route so that we can all be aware of what, uh, what we're really working with and what, what the results we can expect are and whether it's the, the appropriate way to go. Um, I think there's just one more slide then. Um, yeah, this is just thing, some things to, to bear in mind. Uh, 11239 and the, the technical specification, they were, they were written um, with the intention of describing how to create a database that would be used uh, globally. So really to share relevant information globally. Um, they aren't intended to, to say, right, if you have a national database, then you must comply with this standard because that's not necessarily going to be of use to anyone if your national database or regional database is only used in this one region. It doesn't need to have all of the complexities and um, necessarily be compatible with everything else um, as a central um, control vocabularies would need to be. Um, but we could provide guidelines and uh, Ron touched on this, on how to maybe use these central lists regionally and particularly for the characteristics for um, if you want to assign medicinal products in your region, 
the specific characteristics from the central list, um, then it, obviously you need to understand what their purpose is. And uh, I think some, some extra, some, some explanations of this could be provided in uh, 20440. And again, I've I think I've mentioned it three times now, uh, perhaps it's overkill, but it really does have such an effect on the other, uh, particularly PHPID documents that um, we very much need to keep that in mind with, the, uh, with any of these revisions that go forward. Um, I think that's everything. Um, Christian, I'll hand back to you and we can maybe look at questions on what I've said and what Rabel said and maybe bring the panelists in as well. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you, the, the presenter, for this uh, overview and uh, quite extensive overview of uh, the problems uh, we want to address here. Um, we have uh, the Q&A facility to uh, have our dialogue with the participants. And uh, I see uh, we have some pending question. Um, I will start with um, the first, you know, the oldest one, if you want so. Um, it was asked if, if uh, you envisage resistance from countries where legislation stipulates that no substitution is allowed. In addition, uh, it is my impression that pharmacies do not rely on resources such as EDQM for decisions on substitution. And uh, the colleague would be clear, glad to hear our thoughts. I think part of that is uh, raised to Robert van der and uh, the second part to, to Chris. Um, Chris, uh, you are still on with your microphone. Would you like to start? Yes. Um, I don't think that these standards can really interfere with the, the legislation that's applied in the countries. All we can do is provide um, provide options that people can use if they if they if they have substitution allowed, then this might be a way that they can they can organize it better, but it's certainly not going to be something that we say, right, because you use these terms, you must now change your regulations in the country. I think that's way outside the scope of, of ISO and anything we're trying to do. I, I agree, um, and I have nothing to add. Sorry? I agree and I have nothing to add. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, then uh, there is another um, question, and now it's no more. Oh, yes, it's the older one. Is it possible to derive the characteristics from the formal regional definitions, formal in brackets? I, I would like to answer that. Mm -hmm. Because I also ref refer to that, to formalizing definitions. The definitions in EDUQM are now lexical. There are methods to. Um, formalize definitions in a semantical way uh, and then check it whether these, this, uh, the logic of the definition conforms with the description and the characteristics. And um, that's, what, that's an analysis that needs to be done, I think. Thank you. Uh, the PDF in EDQM, sorry, you want sorry, to that, that, add something? Yeah, I just wanted to say that, um, just to put things into context here for, for EDQM, for example, um, the, the characteristics were not intended to be definitional, which is why there are as some, uh, some differences that Rob out, uh, pointed out, such as cutaneous and transdermal. They were grouped together because the characteristics were used in standard terms to help guide people towards the pharmaceutical dose form. And it's just those which the pharmaceutical dose forms themselves each have a full definition. And so that's really what the definition is based on. Um, that's, of course, what's been done in EDQM so far for, for various reasons. And um, you know, there might be other ways to, to look at it. And of course, it's part of what Robel was talking about. Yep. Thank you. Um, the PDF in EDQM are not defined by their linked characteristics in the way that they are implemented today? Is there a suggestion to change this in EDQM? I think it would be difficult to do that, uh, to do it entirely, to have all of the dose form characteristics being completely definitional, uh, because you then, um, you, you, you do somewhat tie your hands and um, 
uh, it could be useful for certain purposes, but uh, bearing in mind standard terms were first created for marketing authorization applications and labeling. Um, if we, if they're going to be used for, um, if these sort of vocabularies are used for other purposes, then it's not always 100% appropriate in all the cases. So uh, some small changes might, might be used, but I'd be surprised if we got to every single dose form having a unique list of characteristics. I don't know how many additional uh, characteristics you'd need to add in. I mean, we have, uh, for example, just uh, tablets. You have um, a normal tablet, an uncoated tablet, which we just call tablet. You have a film coated tablet. We have coated tablet for you know, sugar coated tablets. If you really want to get down into the granularity of those, um, that's when we use the specific dose, pharmaceutical dose form and the definition to, to describe it. Uh, trying to come up with characteristics for every single character, every single aspect that you want to define is, as I said, it might tie your hands a bit, uh, depending on the on the use case. In other cases, it might be very helpful to do that, but not necessarily every case. Thank you. Uh, Robert is uh, a candidate to answer the next, next question, which is, uh, you will have to maintain these characteristics as far as possible via ERT automatically and some difficult case manually. Is that correct? If we go down this road, then I think it should be very strict and governed by a, an ontology, which is the result of groupware, of a, a collaborative effort, and verified and certified by, uh, by an international body. Yes. It should, and it should be the rules should be very clear for this. Thank you. Uh, I have a last question apparently here, um, and uh, it is a very um, interesting question in the context of Unicom, to which you see the logo on the slide. Is it going to be possible to test the attributes mapping proposal before any revision of, of eleven two three nine? Based on the work in Unicom and elsewhere, it feels as if the attribute of PDF will need both extension and revision, possibly moving towards being definitional, the mapping approach to be truly viable. Well, the question is certainly uh, to both uh, Robert and Chris. Robert, would you like to start? Yeah, okay. Uh, yes, that's precisely what I proposed. Little tweaking, uh, very, very prudent extension of some value sets, revision of some value sets, probably staying away of tinkering on any of the um, of, of, of the dose forms, it's a granular dose forms itself, and maybe look, having a, a, one run of critical vision to the definitions, some of which are ambiguous. I think Julie, in her presentation, gave some examples of uh, possible ambiguous definitions. So that's it, uh, what I want to say. Thank you. Chris? Um, I think we also need to bear in mind that the standards aren't, um, aren't going to be able to cover the content of uh, those forms. Really, so uh, Julie's question about, for example, extending the attributes I guess that's, um, do we need to add in some extra characteristics such as, is there a coating, is there a sensor? Um, I, I'm not sure, um, I think that it would be interesting to do that. I don't know how long it would take to come to agreement on what the exact characteristics should be and what they should cover and how extensive they are. Um, if you want to become definitional with them, then I think that'll be, that'll take longer than than the, the next year um, to really come to agreement on something like that. Um, but of course, this all depends as well on what the use cases are for the PHP ID and how much detail, how much granularity is needed for all of these different uses that we can, that we can foresee and we can come up with for the, the dose form characteristics and the pharmaceutical dose forms. Thank you. Robert, the addition to the question? Oh. 
Okay, because uh, um, the question was uh, continued after, for example, the Singer paper would suggest that uh, for some PDF, the integral administration device and testing has shown that um, that to be very valuable for inhalation products. No. Um, I don't think it's a, it is a question, it is uh, mostly a statement here. Inhalation uh, mm -hmm. is, a, is a difficult issue because there are many different te technologies, which is go even a little bit beyond for, uh, for those form itself. But uh, yeah, it's more the technology of, of the device to administer. Thank you. Uh, we are narrowing the uh, end of this uh, webinar in uh, something like three minutes. Um, so, um, you have seen as participants that uh, there is this uh, questionnaire open for you. Um, I would like you really to uh, take this opportunity to share um, with us your appreciation and uh, also if you have propositions, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, uh, we would uh, welcome these. Um, coming to the end, uh, of this webinar is for me, uh, of course, the opportunity to thank our speaker, uh, my American colleague uh, Ron Fitzmartin. Um, my uh, he's French a bit, uh, colleague uh, Chris Jarvis, because uh, Chris speaks an excellent French, and uh, my Belgium colleague Robert van der Um It is uh, a big chance uh, to have this uh, three gentlemen having joined us. Um, they are all member of uh, ISO TC215 Working Group 6 and active participating there and uh, we are grateful for this uh, contribution. On the panel side we had um, uh, Malin uh, from uh, WHO uh, Competence Center uh, in Uppsala and I think uh, it is uh, she uh, did not speak so much but what she said is gold worth. Um, they are working to uh, so um, the, the, you know, that GMP is possible. And um, in this uh, period where we have especially vaccines, as uh, Robert did point out, um, it is really necessary that some authority and who best us, uh, WHO at uh, UMC, uh, who best of them can uh, tell us the truth uh, because they have that legitimation um, uh, as international body. Uh, uh, so she expressed that and um, I think uh, that was uh, uh, really uh, important to, to be here, heard here. Um, the other panelists uh, were not directly questions and uh, that's unfortunate, but we would possibly need uh, another half an hour to uh, uh, bring them also to, uh, to the desk. Um, unfortunately, uh, we don't have this half an hour now, but um, uh, I thank them also for having joined us uh, as a, a panelist. Uh, please note, so we have uh, the next uh, community of expertise in about a month. Uh, it will be on the, uh, uh, the requirements for an IDMP, ISO IDMP logical model. Uh, it is a difficult uh, topic. Yeah. It refers to um, a deliverable from uh, Unicom Work Package 1, um, which is publicly accessible. Um, it would be good that uh, some of you have uh, an eye on it before the, uh, the webinar, because it's uh, rather uh, technical, although our speaker will bring that to you, um, to your understanding uh, easily, I'm sure. Uh, and then we have a panel discussion. The panel will be larger, uh, as usual, because we think um, the different angle of view will be also represented in the panel. So uh, please bookmark the, um, the next uh, um, uh, Unicom um, community of expertise and uh, join us at that uh, opportunity and share also the invitation with colleagues of you. Um, this is our open webinars if we uh, exceeds the size of 100, it uh, goes on uh, YouTube, where anyway, you can see the webinar later um, on remote. This said, 
thank you everybody again. Thank you the speaker, the panelists and our audience. And thank you to those who have filled the, uh, the questionnaire uh, for us. That is always uh, helpful. With that, I close the meeting and wish you good health and an excellent end of the week. Goodbye.